Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk Nation Radio, Borders and the New U.S. Government, our guest is Todd Miller, author of the books Empire of Borders, the Expansion of the U.S. Border Around the World, 2019, Storming the Wall, 2017, and Border Patrol Nation, 2014. He is co-author of a recent report for the Transnational Institute called Biden's Border, the Border Industry, the Democrats, and the 2020 Elections. Todd Miller, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you very much for having me, David. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for all your focus on this topic. Uh, so how is uh, how's Biden and his administration doing thus far? Uh, in terms of the border and immigration, I take it. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 interesting. He certainly came um, out with a number of executive orders, uh, executive orders that um, all of them, I believe, are dire uh, directly addressing egregious Trump policies from the four years that Trump was in office, from family separations to the um the remain in mexico program to uh he called for a deportation moratorium um he's he's already he's he's uh, put out proposed legislation around immigration reform so um it i mean there's definitely some really interesting things that that um that the biden administration has done continues to do um they def they definitely are putting a lot of emphasis on DACA and that's deferred action for childhood arrivals or the dreamers and, and helping, you know, young people or not even young people anymore. A lot of middle-aged people now who came to the United States when they're, when they were very young uh, without documents. And so he, I mean, the Biden administration is doing a number of um, things uh, that is, has, has, has uh, has rightfully gotten him some positive media attention. Um, however, I I would uh, really advise to look at a lot of this, a lot of these things with some skepticism, and even the even the executive orders. Um, for example, the deportation moratorium for 100 days that was blocked by a judge in Texas. But even before it was blocked, um, there was. Uh, a stipulation that it didn't include uh, people who had aggravated felonies. Now, aggravated felony is an immigration term. It doesn't even mean necessarily a felony. It's it's a it's an immigration term uh, that was created in during the Ronald Reagan administration in 1986. Then, what was an aggravated felony expanded during the Clinton administration in 1996, and the and what basically aggravated felonies are deportable offenses and that includes shoplifting which isn't even a felony so it includes things that aren't, aren't even felonies and um and this was included this was in the deportation moratorium so all of a sudden i start to look at that and you can look at any of these things and you can start seeing some loopholes but i look at that so one you be, so you won't be deported unless you're going to be deported I mean, there's a loophole for yeah. deportable offenses in the moratorium on deportations. Yeah, except it's under this kind of smokescreen of a term called aggravated felony. So yeah. you think you think, oh, you're deporting. You know, it's it creates this impression that oh, murderers are being deported, right? And it's and it's um, but it's really it's it's a smokescreen, and then it doesn't even matter because that it was blocked anyhow. The deportation moratorium was blocked. Um, but there's another story that's behind that, right? And you can look at a number of of, of other issues that the Biden administration is is is, ad is addressing. Um, but you look at the deportation moratorium, and then you see, oh, there's also a number of companies, private companies, private companies who have gotten contracts over the years, private companies who have gotten contracts over many different administrations, uh, part of a, you know from the Clinton administration in the 90s to the Bush W Bush administration after in the post and directly in the post 9/11 era to the Barack Obama administration to the Trump administration right these there's companies that make money off of deportations and 
for example, if somebody is arrested in the border on the, in the borderlands crossing the border um, near where I live, I live in Tucson, Arizona. Somebody crosses the border, gets arrested by the border patrol. Uh, that person will then be um, handed over to a company called G4S, which has armored transportation kind of jail cells, trucks where they transport people who are who had, whose crime was a, to, to, to go through the desert, cross the border, and they transport them to short-term detention. And then and then uh, then a lot of people will face a judge. And if they, if they face the judge, then then G4S will then transport them again for a prison sentence to a to a private prison company called Core Civic um, in or Geo Group. Uh, in the case of Arizona, it would be most likely uh, Core Civic, and where who would make approximately one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred thirty dollars per day per bed. And so my point is, is that there's underlying the these everything in the in the border and immigration apparatus. There's there's a there's a private enterprise, um, but I would even argue more. There's an industrial complex. An industrial complex that's a branch off the military industrial uh, industrial complex, where many 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 companies have uh, benefited from you know the border and immigration apparatus, its car incarceration uh, elements of it, and these companies um, uh, the the amount of contracts given out by Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement over particularly the last twenty years has just skyrocketed. And these same companies, and this is this is what we looked at in our report. These same companies are, of course, donating, uh, giving campaign contributions to, to candidates, including including the presidential candidates, including Joe Biden. And in the case of the Joe Biden campaign, he received three times more campaign contributions from thirteen border industry industry corporations that we looked at um, than than Donald Trump. And, and is that for the sort of reason that Congress members would always have you believe, namely that that Biden openly pre agreed with them three times as much as Trump and they were harmlessly supporting that agreement? Or was it uh, more likely because they were trying to move Joe Biden to where they wanted him to be, which is how bribes are understood to work in every other country on Earth? Yeah, <laughs> well, maybe um, a little bit of both. Uh, um, it's hard to say because because many of the dealings happen behind closed doors and you can't really see what's going on. Um, what what we did notice in the report is that a lot of these companies have traditionally given more money to Republicans, um, but they shift. It shifts uh, depending on the year, depending on the elections, depending who they who you know who's primed to win the election. And it seemed that in the 2020 election, this shift happened way to the Democrats. And there you go. Joe Biden wins the presidency. But also, you know, Democrats take the Congress as well. And um, and so you see this 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 shift. It's like you you vote. It's like give it. It's like you 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 get a vote and you win no matter what. Like your candidate wins no matter who 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 wins. Right. And um, and so. And, and one one really key thing with the Biden administration and what the Biden administration says about the border is that they do make a, a very strong proclamation. They say, we're not going to allow another foot of border wall to be constructed under the Trump administration. And then it was funny, the first time I read that that line, I kind of paused there midway and and I th and I thought, oh, what are they going to say now? I mean, they're going to put the money to healthcare. Are they going to put that money? Because they say we're going to divert that money. What are they going to say? Healthcare, education, you know, mitigate climate change. What what are they going to What are they going to say next? And of course, what they say next is we're going to make we're going to um, divert that money into technologies and tech. So to understand the border, like the border. The board, like what Customs and Border Protection, C Customs and Border Protection calls their enforcement apparatus. They call it a border wall system. So the border wall is one part of it. The other part of it is armed personnel, the border patrol, and um, sheriffs, deputized sheriffs that work on the border, and 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 then the third part of it is the technology. 
And there's this, this, so it's all the same thing. It's under the same strategy. And so the Biden administration says, oh, we're going to focus, we're going to divert, divert those funds to technology. So what does that mean? That means these uh, complex surveillance towers with cameras that can see 7.5 miles away with a ground sweeping radar that could, has a radius of 13 miles, um, drones doing overflights um, over the borderlands, both in the South and the North and the Caribbean. Um, motion sensors that are implanted underground, um, uh, biometrics technology like facial recognition, iris rec recognition, um, checkpoints that are equipped with all these technologies that are all over the borderlands. It's kind of hard to move anywhere without having to go through a homeland security checkpoint. And so that's this is what that means. And then what that also means is that there's how these technologies get deployed is Customs and Border Protection uh, makes contracts with different companies. And so those companies that were donating to the Biden administration, they're like, oh, yeah, that's what he, where he's diverting the funds to. It looks like we will probably get some more contracts. Right. And, and isn't there, Todd Miller, isn't there something more insidious about cameras and invisible technology compared to a wall in terms of the spread of these abuses to everybody in the United States far from borders. Uh, I mean, you can't pick up the wall and drop it in St. Louis, but the drones and the cameras and the facial recognition and all the rest of it, they can, that, that can spread everywhere, right? Yes, it can. Absolutely. Um, and some, in some cases, the companies call uh, the borderlands a proving ground. So it's a place where technologies go to be proved. It's kind of like how in Israel, Palestine, you know, the Israeli companies will, will deploy technologies like in the occupied territories or along the fringes. And they'll say, well, we're, we're proving that this technology works and then it becomes a selling point. And then you can sell it to other countries around the world. The borderlands are work essentially in the same way. I've heard company executives call it a proving ground. So it's, it's a proving ground to kind of showcase for these technologies. And then there's another point too that um, that the border itself is a hundred mile zone. So the border jurisdiction is um, the actual borderline and it goes a hundred miles inland. And that includes the 2000 mile US-Mexico border, the 5000 mile US-Canadian border, uh, the coast. And so when at the end of that, you look at like, if you can imagine the, the kind of contours of the United States as like a band that goes around it, you're talking yeah. about like the majority of the country is underneath this border, border jurisdiction, uh, 200 million people, two thirds of the country. And these, this jurisdiction is a place where Homeland Security uh, forces can work, Border Patrol usually. And what uh, ACLU, they've revised this since then, but they called it a constitution free zone when they first were looking into it. And that now ACLU says, no, we can't say that because every, everywhere there's constitutional rights. So maybe we should say constitution, constitution mangled zone. Like one uh, CBP executive in Washington told me, we are exempt from the Fourth Amendment. And I went, what? <laughs> like I was in the office, the Ronald Reagan building, building in Washington, D.C. said exempt for the Fourth Amendment, you know, the, the right not to be searched nor seized. And um, pretty much that was the official saying what how it plays out on the ground. So you have these jurisdictions that cover huge swaths of the country, inclu including places where people don't even know they're in the border zone. Um, and like the whole state of Maine is the border zone. The whole state of Florida is a border zone, like places outside the U.S.-Mexico borderlands in which where these these things can happen. And one good example of, what, of your of your question is Portland, Portland from last year. Well, Portland, when, when people were out- um, Oregon or, as opposed to Maine, huh? Uh, yeah, Oregon, sorry. Um, the, when people were out, you know, doing the, in the summer, doing the Black Lives Matter protests, and there were incidents of border patrol agents from the Special Forces Unit of BORTAC who were snatching people from the streets and putting them in unmarked vehicles. Um, and technically, Portland is in the 100-mile zone. If you look, it's in the 100-mile zone because it goes out 10 miles to sea, and it comes up the coast, and Portland falls right in there. So Border Patrol yeah. can effectively do what they do in the desert of Arizona, basically snatch people, 
arrest them, put them in a vehicle, and then detain them. They they brought that to the streets with activists, and that's just one example of some of the protests that happened this summer. Yeah, uh, Todd Miller, our guest, is the author of a recent report for the Transnational Institute called Biden's Border, the Border Industry, the Democrats, and the 2020 Elections. Uh, Todd, I know to get into the the U.S. federal government cabinet to become a secretary of anything, you pretty much required to have massive conflicts of interest. Uh, how does the the current so-called Homeland Security uh, secretary uh, uh, measure up in that regard? He has many conflicts of interest. <laughs> exactly what you say. Um, one of the one of the main ones was that uh, over. He had to disclose during his confirmation hearing, and this is Alejandro Mayorkas, he had to disclose during his um, confirmation hearing that of something, you know, his past. And uh, one of the things he had to disclose was that he made $3 million in the last two years representing an array of companies for a law firm. And two of the companies are two of the companies that we list on our on our um, report, and that's uh, Northrop Grumman which of course is a big military monolith, who's getting more and more border contracts, especially in biometrics. They just got the big, huge renovate. The, the CBP is renovating its biometric uh, system and Northrop Grumman got the big contract to do the first two phases of that. So Northrop Grumman and uh, Latos, who also just made a huge, a, a nearly a billion dollar contract with CBP, also along biometric lines, so those two companies, both of them, both of whom have just got big contracts, um, are also the companies that uh, Alejandro Mayorkas made a lot of money off of um, right before he was designated Secretary of Homeland Security. So uh, I mean that's 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 a prime example of of those conflict of interests. Or is it right in our my 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 from our perspective? Yes, totally. But in their perspective, where companies are are just flowing into the apparatus like fit, you know, like it's it's a part of the whole system. I mean, I wonder even if they if they even if it's even if it's so ingrained in in their systems that it's even seen as anything as an anomaly or anything like that. Well, certainly not an anomaly if there's anyone without massive conflicts of interest. I haven't heard about them, but uh, and it's certainly not a major hurdle in confirmation hearings. But uh, I, you also mention in the report, Todd, the number of, of dead bodies uh, on the borderlands, uh, 8,000 bodies recovered in U.S.-Mexico borderlands between 98 and 2019, uh, and the organization No More Deaths estimates three to 10 times that in recent years, which, you know, a lot of people's definition of a war is a thousand or more dead in a year. Uh, this is almost looking like a war, albeit a one-sided war without an enemy, but a, but a, a war level of, of killing, isn't it? Yes. I think that's, I'm, I would almost say that that's a more appropriate way to look at it. It's a war that the whole strategy forces people in. So all the technology walls, um, border patrol are deployed on the actual in, uh, in the actual like cities or traditional places, which then force people funnel them into places like the desert in Arizona. Um, and this and it becomes there's a number of things that happen. One. One is a, it's a place where nobody can carry, a, not a person can carry enough water or enough food. Um, and, and, and it's extremely hot in the summer and extremely cold in the winter. And so the elements are really, they really play, it's, the elements actually are part of what's known as the, the deterrence, part of the prevention through deterrence strategy. And so, and so it becomes this, kind of war of deterrence but it's hidden because people are forced into these areas where there's no there's no cameras there's no press there's no media there's nobody covering what's going on and it becomes what uh, like a security war in, in a certain to a certain degree where um like a i think um jeffrey halper uh who wrote the who wrote the book war against the people he 
describes it as a securocratic war. It's this how war is shifting um, towards like a ruling class versus pe the dispossessed, right? And that's kind of what plays out. And the whole and the and the and the and there have been eight thousand bodies that have been recovered since this sort of strategy has been implemented in the 1990s. But according to Nomar Das, that, that number is probably, we're probably looking at over 20,000, maybe even 30 or 40 or 50,000. And they, they make those calculations because it's really difficult to find bodies in the desert. And, um, and there's thousands of families that are searching for lost loved ones. And so that you have that element as, of it as well, like families looking for their their loved ones, but but can't find them, and they 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 go to different organizations like No More Dust to try so that they help them out. Yeah, we you mentioned Todd that uh, that Biden had issued a number of executive orders, and some of them were pretty good, but some of those were blocked uh, by courts and so forth. In terms of what he's proposed for Congress or what Congress has proposed for itself, uh, is there anything uh, useful in the works? Well, I think the reversal of of Trump policies is very useful. Like, um, it, I still remains to be still remains to be seen what's going to happen with people seeking asylum, for example, um, the Remain in Mexico program. But reports of the last couple of days was that the Biden administration is allowing people to come back and to, to come into the United States, people who are seeking asylum. What's going to happen is still, or, or how this happens still remains to be seen. Um, the Biden administration is talking about reuniting uh, families who have been separated during the Trump administration. Um, if he's able to do that, there's a number of like outstanding cases um, that that have came over from the last four years. So if he's able to do those sorts of things, um, it would be really helpful, especially for those those families. Um, yeah. So so he, you know, the kind of declaration that agents won't separate families again at the border. Um, those sorts of things seem seem to be useful. What the 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 backstory though is that the whole apparatus. The, the kind of foundational aspects of it, which are not being addressed by the Biden administration. They're all about, you know, dividing families, separating people, um, tearing people apart from each other, just not in the same way at the border in front of the TV cameras like Trump. So you have that one side where it's like almost like like the, what the Biden administration is doing is kind of Band-Aids, uh, a reversal of the Trump policies, perhaps talking about going back to where it was with the Obama administration before Trump, um, which of course the Obama administration also had more deportations, like nearly 3 million than um, any other president in the history of the United States. So if that, and, and I do believe the last number I saw that already under the Biden administration, there's been 26,000 deportations. And so all of it comes with there's there's good things, but it seems like there's the the core elements of it are not being addressed. But while but the reversal of a lot of the Trump um, some of the Trump policies seem to be very good. Stopping the wall from being built is another example um, that you know for many 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 reasons, including environmental reasons, the destruction that's been going on in the borderlands where they're dynamiting canyons and just killing off like the biodiversity here in Arizona, for example, um, you know, that, that saves, you know, some of those sorts of um, violations from happening. But at the same, at the same time, I, I was just at the border wall um, just the other day and I was looking up at it and the construction crews had left and the Trump wall was there, right? It's 30 feet high. It's very tall. But there's no indication that it would be removed, right? It's like whatever Trump did with a the wall, there's no, there's at least up to this point, and I don't imagine there will be any sort of declaration saying we will remove this wall. It's, it's, it seems like it's going to stay there. And so yeah. it, it all comes with this kind of mixed bag sort of feel. 
Uh, Todd Miller, we've got just a few minutes left, and it seems like a mixed bag on immigration policies is uh, a huge cut above uh, the rest of the military industrial complex, where it's pretty much all bad news so far from the Biden White House, including continuing to impose neoliberal policies on the countries south of the border, so openly supporting a coup in Venezuela and so forth. Uh, I haven't heard of any steps directed at making places uh, more desirable to stay in for anyone. Um, and, and so it, it seems there may be more political pressure around certain policies because of who is already in the United States, uh, but it doesn't seem strong enough to to uh, to impact foreign policy. Uh, am I right? Who's who's applying good pressure to the U.S. government and what should people be doing? Yeah, um, as far as one thing that I've really looked into is the extension of the U S border and how it's just going, going like there's, there's elements of it at the Mexico, Guatemala border. It's all over Central America. And, and then Central America, like you look at U S policies in Central America historically and, and contemporarily, and it's just the same, right? It's like the, the kind of neoliberal stranglehold, um, of from going back to the like IMF and International Monetary Fund and World Bank, just um, stratifying those economies, leaving so many people poor and marginalized, and leaving just a very small, rich elite. And then you have like corporations that you know in the with NAFTA and CAFTA and you know these agreements where there's a complete open border policy for the rich and powerful, right? Uh, they're just going in and just digging up natural resources left and right. Um, in in all these places uh, where people are coming to the United States, like like Central America, and so um, and so you have. I, I know I'm dwelling on one part of your question, but you have this this whole I, this whole phenomenon of the U.S. policies and foreign policy, and you know in Central America you have the historic, uh, you know. The, the historic support of military dictatorships and sending arms to the armies and training um, generals in the School of the Americas. And now you have the training of police and that sort of thing still going on to keep things in the status quo. And so you have that as an intrinsic part of the border apparatus. And then, of course, those who challenge those, you know, those sorts of um, uh, they those who, who are challenging these sorts of things like say a Cuba or Venezuela, um, you know, no matter what you think of Maduro, right? There's a challenge to this apparatus and then, and then they instantly become the enemy. And, and it becomes interesting too, because then you see like if a Venezuelan is, is coming to the United States and they are um, looking for us, if they're seeking asylum, well, it's much easier for a Venezuelan to get it if a, than a Guatemalan. Right. Uh, and, and you see that just playing out. And, and that's been the case historically for Cuba. And any sort of country that's labeled a U.S. enemy, um, it seems to correlate, you know, their their citizens will get, not to say that it's super easy, but they'll have Fantastic. an easier path. Uh, very good. Todd Miller, got to leave it there. Most recent book is uh, Empire of Borders, the expansion of the U.S. border around the world. Todd, thank you so much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.